Old video games are too expensive. The idea of stumbling into a Funko Land and buying a used copy of Earthbound for $15 is a total fantasy at this point. If you're looking at retro, say Super Nintendo, Sega Dreamcast, or PlayStation 3, 15 bucks will not be a mid-tier title or a nasty, loose copy of Super Mario World. And that's not even rare. The collector's market has done all sorts of weird, unmentionable things to the classic video game economy, leading to people making some of the worst decisions of all time. And I'm not talking about dropping $800 on a copy of Panzer Dragoon Saga. I'm talking about the people going out there and buying rare and expensive games that suck. Those dropping hundreds, if not thousands, on something that's a bona fide loser. A game whose plastic is better off as a paperweight. For example, Wild Woody for the Sega CD. A game where you play as a pencil. One where you defeat enemies by doing, uh, this. You want frustrating controls, weird alternative metal CD audio, dumb suggestive jokes, and I mean, something where the main character you control is a pencil? Well then, my friend, that'll be $125. Complete. You could buy this brand new shiny copy of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. You could even pay off your electric bills this month. Or you play a bona fide 2 out of 10 classic with some of the most grating cutscenes you've ever seen. Call me Woody. Wild Woody. Now go. See you in a jet, little boy. It's time to start sketching. Yahoo! So yo, it's Austin, and today we're gonna be talking about a whole different section of rare and expensive games, specifically ones that suck, the worst, the most mediocre, and the things that'll make you question the financial aptitude of all your friends. If you ever see me walking out of a convention with a copy of like, Action 52, you smack me right in the face. Bet. A lot of the games I'm talking about today are the kinds that you'll want to visit your buddy Vim for, because no one in their right mind should be making a purchase like Wild Woody in 2023. But you might want to do so under the protection of today's sponsor, NordVPN. All right, I'm gonna be real with y'all. I actually use a VPN all the time. These things have a ton of practical benefits, such as hiding my IP whenever I'm traveling, and most importantly, giving me access to the entirety of the internet. And by that, I'm talking about region locking. You never really know how much you're missing out on until you switch your digital location. Take streaming services. Certain films and series are only available in certain countries, and with NordVPN, you can switch your location and have access to things that may not be available in your country. The same goes with gaming and discount websites. You just gotta click over one of the 5,600 different servers across 59 countries and you can get to exploring whatever you want. I personally use NordVPN multiple times a week to watch wrestling as I, like probably most of y'all, have cut cable. Lucky for me, NordVPN's the fastest out there so you're not gonna get bandwidth throttled as it encrypts your traffic so ISPs can't slow you down. This is really useful for phones as well as there's a NordVPN client on mobiles, meaning that if you're traveling or just wanna protect yourself on that public Wi-Fi with the press of a button, you can feel safe to browse. And Nord's got that threat protection now, meaning that it can detect and inspect intrusive ads and downloads so you won't be the victim of malware, which I'm sure we all know sucks. I think everyone out there has got a use for a VPN and NordVPN's a great service to be using. And hey, you can get an exclusive deal over at nordvpn.com forward slash eruption VPN. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day guarantee. Give it a shot, check out the internet without region locking, you're not gonna be disappointed. That's nordvpn.com forward slash eruption VPN to save today. Thanks to NordVPN for the sponsor. But for now, we need to get back to our topic of today, good old fashioned bad video games. They just also happen to cost hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for no reason. And I figure we might as well get the ball rolling with the best way I know how, a bunch of stinky licensed games. Now you might be thinking licensed games, those aren't rare. Those are the things that you find in discount bins. I mean, you can still pick up a copy of Speed Racer the Movie The Game for $12 complete, that's great. Or you can pick up a copy of Disney Sports Basketball, the one made by Konami for a grand total of $1,000. Wait, what? Disney, sports, and basketball are three words that sound good together, especially when you have good old Konamers working on it. I mostly say that because they released wow. Tiny Toon Adventures Acme All-Stars, which is one of the best licensed arcade sports games of all time. So if they were gonna make a full basketball title featuring some of the most iconic cartoon characters, I think anyone would be excited. This was one of the many Disney sports titles they'd put out. We got Disney sports soccer, Disney sports football, skateboard, Boarding, snowboarding, motocross, all of which, of course, have amazing reviews. Threes, fives, let's go. You want jank? Boot up Disney Sports Skateboarding and get you some jank. All of these games have the same music and this narrator that will not stop talking. Couple 
of these are worth a pretty penny, but for some reason, basketball's recently reached the four-figure zone, and I have no idea why. This is one of the most bare-bone titles out there. Your team consists of a single memorable Disney character with their squad of jobbers, who also have names for some reason. And if you don't remember them, the narrator will remind you. Barney gets ready to take the cleanest, snags the ball. This is the worst it's ever been. Please stop. Basketball is not a very deep sport, but this release feels like it should have been a mini game with several, if not all of the Disney sports titles together. The gameplay is very basic. You can do some special dunks where you'll fill up a power meter, but besides that, there's nothing else. There's no unlocks, and for some reason, a character slot's used on Mortimer Mouse. You know, Mickey's longtime rival. Yeah, I love this guy. If you must play basketball with Mickey and friends, the Game Boy Advance version of the this is superior in every way. It's cheaper, you can make teams of actual characters, and there's no one screaming, Cletus, anytime you shoot a ball. It's wild that this is that expensive. And if you ever have a friend go, yo, I picked up Disney Sports Basketball, feel free to judge. The same goes out to anyone collecting for the Virtual Boy. I just had to look into the prices for this thing, considering it's widely heralded as a massive failure that'll ruin your eyes for life, and sure enough, you can easily spend several hundreds on a Virtual Boy game. You could really throw a dart in any direction and pick one of these as bad, considering using the hardware is a big pain in the butt. However, I'm not gonna say anything bad about Jack Bros or Wario Land, cause you can see pretty cool things here that would have made excellent Super Nintendo releases. Just uh, maybe not something like Waterworld. That'll be $400 complete, please. Waterworld seems to be a little out of the public eye these days. Some may only recognize it as the place where the One Piece Universal Studios show takes place, but the game Waterworld is essentially asteroids? A recreation of one of the most classic arcade titles of all time, but worse in every way. This is basically a nothing release, one with a 3D face coming at you every now and then, and visuals that get nauseating after a couple minutes. I can't imagine playing this on actual hardware when emulation for 10 minutes made me feel sick, and that really just goes to show that the Virtual Boy was destined to fail. This thing is nowhere near good enough to be this pricey, and I assume people only buy it to have a complete Virtual Boy set. On a console with only 22 games, Waterworld is one of the worst. Speaking of video games based on films that came out in the mid-90s, The Crow. No, not that one, the bad one, City of Angels. After the success of the original Crow and the untimely tragedy of Brandon Lee's passing, Dimension Films wanted to milk that comic book franchise directly into the ground, and by God did they. The Rotten Tomatoes score drop off for the series is something special. From 84 and well regarded to straight to DVD and a big fat zero. At this point, the iconic look of the crow might as well be most attributed to the wrestler Sting. <laughs> But for gamers, it was probably the Crow City of Angels for the PlayStation 1, or a WCW NWO Revenge. City of Angels really did its best to follow in the footsteps of the sequel's review scores. This thing is bad. Developer Grey Matter and everyone's favorite Acclaim decided that they were gonna combine 3D beat-em-up action with pre-rendered backgrounds, and one look at the gameplay here and you can already tell it's got tank controls. I don't like these in general, but they absolutely do not work with this type of thing. Check out this riveting gameplay. Most of the time, you'll spend trotting forward through these backgrounds, 90% of which all look the same. You've got a distinct lack of combos, and if someone decides to strafe slightly, you've got to rotate your entire body and hope it connects. Spoiler, it probably won't. The backgrounds will change randomly when you don't expect it. The level design doesn't have any clarity, and you'll basically be following giant glowy crows on the ground and hoping the next zone loads. And did I mention? The combat's terrible? City of Angels was widely panned when it came out, with the exception of the Sega Saturn magazine, because I guess they were chosen for any game at all, but even IGN tossed this thing a 1 out of 10, their lowest possible score. Yet somehow, today, people end up paying actual money for this, with complete copies going for around $100. Though that might be worth it just to see the intro cutscene. If there was ever an argument for video games as an art medium, this, this is it. 
Speaking of art museums and games being worthy only via sarcasm, how about that Nintendo 64 library? Don't get me wrong, I love the thing, it came out when I was six, and Super Mario and Bomberman 64 will always be my jam, until Harvest Moon came and ruined my life. Love that game. However, it seems like no matter the quality, if you're going for complete, collecting for the Nintendo 64 is expensive. It seems like if you were a console rocking cartridges, you were doomed to have 80% of your packaging tossed out by parents trying to save space. If it weren't in a jewel or DVD case, you threw that thing right into the trash, bye bye. That's probably why the cost of these things triples or even quadruples when you get a case in manual. Harvest Moon 64 literally shoots up from 50 to 230 with some paper and cardboard, and that's just crazy. Just maybe not as crazy as the worst version of StarCraft going for 260. Blizzard's StarCraft is not bad, not even close. It's a quintessential real-time strategy game that was once the most popular competitive title in the world. If you've never seen anything on Korean StarCraft team houses, they're fascinating. But you know, imagine playing that with one of these. StarCraft 64 is basically like listening to a brand new album on cassette in a souped up Ford Pinto instead of flack on your headphones. It manages to adapt the control scheme the best they can, but there's a reason this genre is mostly on PCs. They even had to change the way these function in order to get something like Halo Wars running well, and even that feels like a lesser version of a good old mouse and keyboard. Never mind playing this thing multiplayer split screen where it's dragon ass on the frame rate. You can see what your opponent's doing at all times, so unless you have cardboard in the middle of the TV, and you're doing it with one of the worst controllers of all time. Even worse if you're rocking one of these. StarCraft to StarCraft 64 is basically like Mortal Kombat 1 to Mortal Mortal Kombat 1 on the Switch. Just replace that tiny Jim Rayner with Johnny Cage doing his best. One of the first games I bought to review on this channel was Starshot Space Circus Fever. I hated this thing. It was one of those weird French infograms platformers about a juggler traveling around the galaxy and a Anna Carney. Your typical circus and or wrestler things. It's just also an extremely low tier Nintendo 64 platformer on a console that in my mind still has the greatest of all time. And that game didn't have music like this. I know the Nintendo 64 wasn't well known for its audio drivers, but this feels uh, underwhelming even up against other things on the platform. You got Ogre Battle 64 giving us symphonies, Bomberman the Second Attack sounding like 90s club music, and Banjo-Kazooie doing the banjo thing. And Star-Lord's out here like... Beyond that, the gameplay is rough, you're constantly battling the camera for positioning, and there's a whole lot of floating nothing leap of faiths here. The Nintendo 64 draw distance really shows its butt in Starshot, because you'll go long segments without being able to see anything of note. Just a big void. There's also no melee attack. You can fly and shoot uh, blue crystals, but the gameplay is really uninspired despite the ridiculous setting of a space traveling circus. There is a much better PC version of Starshot Space Circus Fever, but it's just one of those games that I don't think many people care about. Despite that, a loose copy will still run you a Benji, three if you want it complete. <laughs> How can this be? That's the Nintendo 64 power, even when the cheap yearly sports titles cost around 20 to 25 complete, just about everything's pricey. So let's take it up a notch, the Blockbuster exclusive. Those games that would only be available for rental at the Block EB and wouldn't be available for purchase until some reseller got a hold of it, meaning that the boxes were usually really hard to come by. Obviously, this was a lot more difficult than just strolling into your local Babbage's and being like, hey, give me the thing. So the prices were a little ridiculous, but how ridiculous. $5,000. You can get a lot with that. You can put a down payment on a brand new car. You can pay for a few months of rent. You could buy a super top of the line PC or even a brand new drum set. A nice one too. Or a boxed copy of Clay Fighter Sculptor's Cut. I just really hope you wouldn't. Sculptor's Cut is the blockbuster exclusive update to Clay Fighter 63 and a third. A few new characters, a couple of gameplay updates, ink the deal with the rental store, and bada bing bada boom, Interplay got paid. Unfortunately, the 64-bit variants of Clay Fighter also happen to suck the big one. It is a neat concept. I'll always love stop motion claymation as a medium for visual effects, but in trying to parody the genre of fighting games, they failed to make a good one. On top of that, you're 
once again using this god tier three prong movement machine in order to input combos. And Sculptor's Cut is a six button fighter, meaning you're gonna be using the C buttons. The value of this is 100% its scarcity, as it's been estimated that there's less than 20,000 of these out there in the wild, which is also around the same amount I would expect for most of the blockbuster exclusives. Some good, like Stunt Racer 64, others Clay Fighter. Then you got Transformers Beast Wars Transmetals, eight syllables of power, and once again, a terrible fighting game. Get ready to hear about Beast Mode on the reg. Vehicle mode. Beast Mode. Beast Mode. I love me some Beast Wars. This was the way I consumed Transformers as a kid because that was slightly before my time. So when I heard of a Beast Wars game coming to my Nintendo 64, I yelled at my parents to crank the car. We had to get it. Then wait an additional three weeks because it was constantly checked out before excitedly plopping it into my console and being greeted with an awful 3D arena fighter. There's just a lot of running in circles and trying to hit your opponent while they do the same. The combo system isn't well, there's actually no combo system at all. You just hit one of the buttons, do one of the moves, watch the background rotate around you. This thing is busted to heck. It's broken. And even if you're a massive Beast Wars fan, it was a big ol' stinky disappointment. How do you go and make it Beast Wars Transmetals video game without any Dinobot? What y'all doing? Weirdly, this eventually did come out of the blockbuster exclusivity hell, so there's multiple variants for the covers, both on the box and the cartridge. There was even a PS1 port that came out the same day, which was neither of those. However, if you're wanting that full PNG of a corporate logo on the box with the game inside, it's gonna run you upwards of $600. What's going on with this cover anyway? It's so bad. There's so much empty space and you can barely see Megatron behind the logo. Yo, Bam Entertainment, give me this person's job. I'll just swap it out with a Japanese cover. The one where Optimus Primal looks like an approving dad. Anyways, I hope they bring back Beast Wars one day, but only if the CG looks exactly the same. Well, you did start it, gearhead. I beg to differ, cheese lips. <laughs> ah, classic. You can't go wrong with Beast Wars unless it's uh, either of those terrible games. Try again. Speaking of, I think before we go further into the obscure zone, we should talk about a couple of the classics. If you've been like following gaming for several years, there's a high chance that you've probably heard of some of the next few I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to talk about them anyway like Family Fun Fitness Stadium events. The most recent listing of this that sold popped off at $16,000 loose, and what you see on the screen, this is it. Do one of four Olympic-styled sporting events and do it by mashing buttons on your controller or by stomping on the Family Fun Fitness mat, the most 80s thing possible. Nintendo apparently liked this technology, so they acquired it and re-released it as world-class track meet with their power pad, but neither of those go for five figures. The game itself I mean, you're looking at it. This is it. Run, you fool. A gimmick when it was released, absolutely outdated in 2023, and while it's not terrible, it's certainly not worth that price to any reasonable human being. If you're looking for flat out bad, you gotta instead check out the once forgotten cult hit, Plumbers Don't Wear Ties for the Panasonic 3DO. FMVs? No. We're talking about screenshots. Screenshot based visual novel, one that looks cheap as hell, was cheap as well, and received an extremely negative reception at release. I mean, the whole story is about trying to get these characters, John and Jane, to date each other, all while being tossed into dumb situations. You could also enter cheat codes to reach the naughty scenes. You know why you're here. Over time, its ridiculousness has been appreciated by fans, and it's now reached a point where people see it as one of those so bad it's good releases, but it's hard to get over some of the production values. That'll be $280 and a 3DO, please. Or just waiting a tiny bit longer for the definitive edition. Who asked for this? I have no idea. I, I guess it's kind of funny. Super 3D Noah's Ark, a Wolfenstein 3D conversion, Nuff said. Back in the 90s, Christian game developer Wisdom Tree wanted to make some faithful games for Nintendo consoles, but only a few of them were able to get officially licensed by Nintendo. One of them wasn't, Super 3D Noah's Ark, and this thing was ugly. It's since been ported to DOS and even Steam these days, but on the Super Nintendo, it was like having a permanent debuff on your eyes. In this thing, you roll around Noah's Ark feeding angry animals, which honestly goes against the whole two of each 
huge species thing they were going for, but I digress. Look, it's just a crappy, non-violent version of Wolfenstein 3D. You've most likely heard of it, and I think its infamy has led to copies going for around a $240 box. I'm gonna go on a limb here and say that anyone buying this isn't trying to actually play it when you can snag it on Steam on sale for like $2. For those who aren't feeling the Holy Spirit, there's the guide game, the easiest way to end up on a list. You buy the trash, play the trivia, see a video game version of Girls Gone Wild and feel empty inside. This whole thing gained a ton of infamy due to a lawsuit as they had included an underaged contestant so they obviously had to pull it from the stores. But even with a reprint, copies of this thing go for simply too much. A hundred? No. Go straight to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. Which was actually the original retail price of Action 52. Easily the most widely known expensive hunk of junk. The story behind Action 52 is wild. It was done by a developer named Active Enterprises who didn't have a single other game to their name. Their whole goal was to try to recreate this bootleg product from Taiwan that was a 40 in 1 collection of games tossed together, but you know, legally. The mission was simple. The execution, uh, you tried. Multi-cart video games weren't known in the West at the time, and there were only a few people on this thing, all uncredited. You just know they were shoving out stuff as fast as they could. Games like Haunted Hall, Sombreros, Bleeps and Blips, or Hambo's Adventures. There's at least 15 different shmups, a Prince of Persia clone, and even games that straight up don't function. They even held a contest with their game Ooze. Anyone who could beat level 6 got entered into a drawing for $104,000. Too bad the game constantly crashes on level 2, meaning the entire contest didn't happen. I'm personally a big fan of Fuzz Power. Mostly because this is nightmare fuel. Action 52 is most famous for the final game on the list, Cheetah Men. It's the game with the most effort put into it. Heck, the only one with a cutscene title crawl showing us the meme-worthy Cheetah Men and one banger of a music track. just unfortunately still sucks. Most of the games in this cartridge are unfinished, barely anything, or just boot up and get you killed within seconds. All of these suck, and it's not worth the price, obviously, but there was a Cheetah Men 2 prototype that was found in a warehouse and thrown onto the reseller market that goes for several thousand these days. But considering Action 52 launched at 200, accounting for inflation, that's like, what, $450 today? Which is just short of what it goes for complete in 2023, so really, Action 52's held its value strong, which is more than you can say for the entire NFT market. Classics are fun, but I want to talk about the weird stuff, and oh boy, we got weird stuff. These are the types of games that you may have heard of, or maybe even saw sitting down at a retro store where it caught your eye, but you didn't think even one second about it. Obscure, terrible, and expensive. The real freak stuff. It's all fun in games. Like, not the, not the concept. Like, Fun and games for the Super Nintendo. Hey, raise your hand if you knew Mario Paint had a clone. Yeah, that wasn't a joke. Originally for the Sega Genesis, developer Leland Interactive, I guess, wanted a piece of that Mario Paint pie and put this out in 1994. The Genesis version was actually compatible with the Mega Mouse. It's also my first time learning that the Genesis had a mouse. Fun in games isn't inherently terrible, but it's also just a worse version of Mario Paint in literally every manner. There's so many similarities between these two that you would think it was just a skin or a palette swap. The included minigames are a basic Pac-Man clone and a space shooter, and the music creation feature is just a jankier version of something I've already heard people recreate through the fire and the flames on. I guess you can click on the style button and do whatever this is. Crazy. Silly. Cool. Wild. You can find a solo cartridge of fun and games without too much hassle, but a complete in-box copy gets wild with some of these going for over $600 these days. SNES mouse not included, so you might as well just pick up a copy of Mario Paint, have a better product, and call it a day. Better yet, open Winamp with your favorite d and Angel skin, pop on some Evanescence, and go to town on MS Paint. Console kids, stay losing. Winamp. Winamp. It really whips the llama's ass. Next up, I, I feel like we need to talk about your health. Yeah, yeah, you. I think you may not be properly educated on these things, probably because you're spending like way too much time playing Warframe these days. I get it, you'll like it. But what about something educational, like the mini Raya Systems games on the Super Nintendo? Bronchi the Bronchiosaurus, Rex Ronin, Experimental Surgeon, Captain Novalin, and pac 
Loki and Marlon. These are the Avengers of educational platformers, and you're gonna show some respect. In the 90s, Raya Systems, now Health Hero Network, wanted to make educational games to teach young people about social issues and those who may have health problems. Perhaps intended to create video game representation to those suffering from issues like asthma and diabetes, the mission was there, it was good, and some of these were even funded by the National Institutes of Health. All four of these games weren't things that you would see in Electronic Gaming Monthly. They weren't even games you'd randomly pick up at a Toys R Us. I mean, heck, some of them didn't even have ratings on the boxes because they were meant for hospitals and dentist offices for kids to play while waiting to be scarred for life. They're also all really bad. In Bronchi the Bronchiosaurus, you take control of exactly what I just said as you go through terrible platforming levels while learning about how to use your inhaler. If you got asthma, here's how to deal with it. Maybe you listen to a doctor over this game though. It does this thing where the screen becomes darker as your asthma worsens, so you have to pause and use it in order to recoup your health. You gotta check your flow. Or if you're too far gone, you can call for help and reset the level. You just gotta be ready to answer trivia as you slowly walk through levels and some of the most basic platforming you can imagine. $350? No, I'm not kidding. There's also Rex Ronan Experimental Surgeon, where you get this, pull a magic school bus and get small. Hop along the tongue, Mr. Rex Ronan, f up that plague and go deep into the trachea with mode, mode seven. seven. You could pass this thing off as a messed up stage from Earthworm Jim 2, just one that throws random bits of trivia at you anytime you finish a level. Rex Ronan is like the cooler version of Osmosis Jones, just one that's fending for his life against the evil Blackburn Tobacco Company who tried to assassinate him via digestion. It's not terrible, it's weird, but at $200 complete, no. Captain Novolin. I'm sure a lot of y'all have heard of this one. A game about watching your blood glucose and using insulin to manage your blood sugar. It's the cap against diabetes as he goes through levels thinking about his doctor telling him what he can and cannot eat. We've got to save the mayor who's been kidnapped. No, Novolin's not the cap from Avengers, although Rhea Systems did have a canceled title, The AIDS Avenger. Gee, I wonder why that got canceled. This is a... Uh... Yeah, it's, it's nothing. Although it is $400 boxed. Who needs to pay rent when you can buy the diabetes game? Last one, Packy and Marlin. It's, it's fine. Basically bronchy with the diabetes theming, but not overtly awful either. Just, you know, way more money than anyone should ever spend for a game about elephants trying to manage their blood glucose. I love that the final boss here is essentially the same as Super Mario Brothers 2, except unfortunately, it wasn't all a dream. So, Rhea Systems Educational Super Nintendo Games. You can get them all for $1,200. <laughs> a spooky price. And you know what's coming up soon? October, as in Halloween. My partner's favorite holiday in the time of the year where I look for the latest guy with a beard to dress up as. Matt Murdock, let's go. Except this video is about rare, obscure, expensive, terrible video games. So what better way to celebrate than with bona fide steamer, Spirits and Spells. Also known as Castleween in the Europes, this is a 3D platformer about, you guessed it, Halloween. You take control of Alicia, a girl dressed up as a witch, and Greg, a boy in a devil costume. On a night of trick-or-treating gone wrong, you end up in a 3D punishment platformer that's got the BS of a ghosts and goblins with the appearance of a monster house. Also this. <laughs> they recorded individual dialogue of this, but not voiceover of the words being said for the entire game. What? Spirits and Spells feels like one of those projects that got started with a decent idea, but completely lacks an audience. You die in one one hit unless you got one of those fairies, but also environment hits will knock you out immediately. You'll see entire levels repeat themselves as you get powers over time, but it's barely more than a two button platformer. One that's too hard for young children who this is clearly aimed at. You can jump, you can smack, you can switch between the two characters, the camera angles are forced, and this just seems like a PlayStation 1 game that slid out on the GameCube. Everything you do has no oomph to it. It's like a sauceless pasta. I feel like I'm running in a line and pressing a button to spin like Crash Bandit. Bandicoot, but there's no impact to any of my hits. Even when you die, you just instantly teleport back to the last checkpoint. There's a bare minimum of feedback here. It actually reminds me of Jersey Devil, just without any other personality, and that's kind of the best I could say about it. How this thing priced up to nearly 150 complete is beyond me, but practically everything on the GameCube goes for way too much. Like Pokemon Box Loose for over a thousand. Collectors are something else. Emulation for everyone. So what's there to say about spirits and spells? I'm not really sure, but there is a Game Boy Advance version that's better and goes for even more. You just unfortunately lose the voiceover. All right. 
It's barrel time. I found it. I dug my hand straight to the bottom and pulled out some of the most valuable, worthless experiences that I could think of. And I hope you all appreciate them. Which of course means that this section of the video is gonna be called What the F? Starting with everyone's favorite legendary console. You know it, you love it, the Sega 32X. Spider-Man Web of Fire is a shoe in for this. It's way too pricey and it's one of the biggest failures on that entire console. Or expansion? We talked about that in my Forgotten Marvel Games video those. So oh, how about Brutal Unleashed Above the Claw? Developed by Game Tech, who are most famous for adaptations of American game shows, Brutal Unleashed is an updated version of a fighting game that hit multiple consoles in 94. Reviews for the time praised it for having decent graphics and a lack of slowdown. So you know the bar was low back then. Brutal Pause of Fury was okay, but this is Unleashed. What's this like? <laughs> This is the most Sega 32X game I've ever seen in my life. Pause of Fury was a mediocre fighting game at best, and Above the Claw decided they were gonna pull themselves a Street Fighter 2 Turbo and introduce Sega gamers to the next generation of furry combatants. Although it just seems like the AI is indestructible and it's sure to keep players on the sidelines. The default speed of this thing was cranked up so much that it's hard to tell what's going on. Also, they decided to remove all the special moves. Hado can't do any fireballs until you do a little mini game in between stages. Ages, so you're just stuck doing basic punches and kicks, which do not seem to work against the AI. I had to cheese the heck out of the first dude because half of my attacks were going over him. It just goes to show this ain't working. The character choice is what you would expect, yet somehow dumber than it looks. We've got Tai Cheetah, there's Pantha. Each character has a classified ad at the bottom where it's like, if you're a cool and chill dude, you'll like him. How about Foxy Roxy, a capricious and playful soul who, according to the manual, is also a politician and social activist. I'm sure this didn't awaken anything in anyone. Just make sure to adjust the game speed to your liking. We've got normal, turbo, and turbo nutter. Yup, turbo nutter. Section over, we're good. That's all we need. $131 if you want a complete inbox turbo nutter. Let's stay with the wacky consoles and move over to a favorite as of late, the Atari Jaguar. One of the very last games on the platform and what was originally Atari's answer to Virtua Fighter, Fight for Life. Let's check it out. I didn't mean to stack multiple bad fighting games here, but wow, this one's rough. And also impressive, Fight for Life was mostly made by a single person, Francois Yves Bertrand, who was a programmer on Sega's classic. Atari nabbed the dude after and wanted him to give them some of that 3D magic, and by God did he try. The 64-bit Jaguar did its best to output those early 3D polygons, but it just didn't come together. Fight for Life looks and feels more like an unfinished prototype. Type. The movement of everyone is way too slow, the characters are all generic, and you can essentially infinite with some of the specials. On your head. There's more expensive Jaguar games, some of which are terrible, like Ultra Vortec, but only Fight for Life has a guy named Pog. If I can't say anything else, I can at least say I played as Pog. BC Racers. What if Mario Kart for the Super Nintendo sucked? Terrible sound, low field of vision, all the characters are generic, uninspired cavemen and women, and this is technically supposed to be part of the Chuck Rock series. That's right, we got a Chuck Rock universe. Most versions of this go for around $100, and I have no idea why, because it's easily one of the worst things Core has put out. Yeah, Tomb Raider Core, rest in peace. At the very least, the Sega CD version has a full motion animated sequence. Well, I'll never get tired of these. You would think I would get tired of Garfield though. A while ago, I put out a video where I play and talk about every Garfield video game that was out of that time, and well, I skimmed over one, and now it's worth a pretty penny. There's a handful of stupid, rare, expensive PAL region games. Anything by those weird Phoenix Games publishers goes for a lot, even if it's just weird, terrible animation like Lion and the King 2. Not to be confused with Lion King 2. What's the matter, Daddy? Garfield Saving Arlene is a game that's in the title, but also a PAL exclusive that goes for over 100 complete, making it one of the rarest and most expensive Garfield games out there. It's basically the prequel to Lasagna World Tour, and I wasn't aware, but it's also worse in every way. It starts with Garfield and Odie doing Garfield and Odie things before the orange tabby realizes that Arlene's being taken to the <laughs> animal annihilation facility. Odie, hurry up, you gotta save her. 
because I'm a bit tired right now. Why is Garfield weirdly feathered at the bottom? Who do I need to teach Photoshop to? After that, you go level to level, eating food, kicking dogs into the sewers, getting wrecked by terrible puzzle platforming, and inflating yourself. I... I don't like this. I don't like it at all. Saving Arlene isn't broken or poorly designed, but it is a total slog that'll make you wonder, who asked for this? Who wanted a Garfield platformer in the 2000s? Why did he get so many video games? And why did this only come out in Europe? There's just so many questions. Who in the right mind is paying $100 plus shipping for Garfield saving Arlene? I assume the answer is either Jim Davis or Super Eye Patch Wolf, and I will accept no other answers. But worst of of all, Garfield saving Arlene is a collector's item. It's time to end this. And I think I've saved the best for last, or the worst. A game with a mystery, a story, something that wasn't even sold in stores, one that's been floating around on the internet for decades and also probably haunts the dreams of a couple of kids that watched Fox Kids in 2002. You probably haven't heard of it, but maybe, just maybe, you remember the words Urban Yeti. What's that crazy sound? It's Urban Yeti for Game Boy Advance. Get your own. 1877 Get Yeti. A number not quite as memorable as other commercials, but one that'd be a battle cry for a. maybe one person? Urban Yeti is a real game made by real people, specifically Cave Barn Studios, who are responsible for BattleBots Beyond the Battle Box and a Tom and Jerry game. It's also gotta be one of the strangest things I've ever put my hands on. This is stylized like a Grand Theft Auto clone, but it's also not open world at all. It's instead the quest of a Yeti to find another Yeti to mate with. <laughs> hear that? That's the mating call of the female Yeti. You must find her, but not before getting a job, paying the bridge toll, riding a car, avoiding the cops, participating in a discus tournament, and struggling through some of the most awful FPS this side of the 2000s. Urban Yeti is fascinating, especially when you realize that this commercial was allegedly the only way you could order this in the States. Looking at the website on Wayback Machine shows what looks like a total joke, and hey, maybe it was. Maybe they knew they were putting out a big stinker, but they didn't care. There's even an ass seat on TV bumper on it. Real motion captured Yeti. Human AI adapts as you progress through the game. High quality music provided by advanced sound drivers, huh? Let's check it out. Oh my god, what is going on? Urban Yeti can be beaten in 30 minutes, and most of that is spent wandering around this open world waiting for GPS markers, then participating in one of four mini games you can play. The 3D for Game Boy Advance is really impressive, but looking at the whole picture really makes you think. How did this not make it to store shelves, yet get the official Nintendo seal of quality on the back? And somehow Bob's game couldn't. Why was this made? How does this have a 67 on Metacritic? Why won't people stop yelling? Besides just running around and smashing things, the Yeti goes through a few mini games, which are all just conversions of more famous titles like Tubin and Root Beer. Except the customers will come and beat you up if you mess up the order. Dude, this whole game is bizarre. I love the intro text where it asks the important questions like, does the Yeti crave a family? The final level is just you running around throwing chickens into a hot dog machine before then winning our Urban Yeti prize, a wife. Wow. She's beautiful. Urban Yeti is a video game. It totally sucks, but even then I still kind of love it. Will I spend over $300 for a complete inbox copy? No. So there you have it. A bunch of rare games that suck. I told you we'd be digging deep. And I think we did it. Also, if this was about Rareware, the video would probably be just as long. <laughs> it's interesting watching the video game market shift around while I make these rare and expensive video game videos. Something like Rad on the PlayStation 2 has gone down while others have skyrocketed. I'll be keeping my eyes peeled for future videos as well because it seems like y'all like these. Speaking of, if you liked today's, check out today's sponsor, NordVPN, or if you wanna support the channel directly, you can head on over to my Patreon or buy a t-shirt over at the Pixel Empire. All of your support, whether it's financial or just subscribing, commenting, and clicking a like goes back into the channel. It helps me to pay my editors and, you know, 
helps us get out videos here in a jiffy. If there's any other rare or bad games you think I should cover in the future, let me know down in the comments. There's gonna be a very short hiatus on videos, but I'll be back at the very end of October and then, you know, having stuff for the rest of the year, so stay tuned for that. Watch me come back with a copy of Action 52 like a complete idiot. Anyways, I've been Austin and catch me next time when we talk about some more delisted games because they've added so many since that last one. Thank you all so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Aaron Quolek, Blackfoot Ferret, Blake Thomas, Cheeks, Chris Shelton, Doug Prince, DX Buster, Dylan Snyder, Elijah, GM Pinks, Hey Quiggles, Ida Vice, J Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Kevin Zanowski, Kieran Arder, Nick Irving, Brian Talbert, and Vox. Thank you all so much for your generous support. 10 years and a month. I'm about to take a quick vacation for myself. It's a couple weeks, but it's something that I've been needing for a little while now. It's crazy to think that we've been going this whole time, and again, I can never thank you enough of the support. I love doing these rare games videos. There's always so many obscurities in the higher echelons of each console, and I, I'm more than willing to do more of these. Let me know in the comments. For now, I'm gonna actually take that nap and uh, see you guys in a couple weeks. Take care of yourselves, uh, drink some water, and give the nearest dog you know a pet, because they're good. Okay, bye.